On Five News tonight, why Jeremy Corbyn and George Osborne might lose their jobs as MPs. The UK has its hottest day of the year so far. And we test the new plastic fibre. New rules could see up to 50 MPs lose their seats and make it even harder for Labour to get into power again. What a scorcher, as much of the country basks in the hottest September day for over a century. And cash and curry were out and about with the Bank of England governor as he tests the new £5 note. Also tonight, the Battle of Orgreave. More than 30 years after miners and police clashed, campaigners are asking the Home Secretary for a public inquiry. I'll speak to their lawyer. And on Roald Dahl's 100th birthday, another generation of children falls in love with his stories. The only people who actually mean are the grown-ups. There's lots of chocolate in some of them, and children love chocolate. Good evening, welcome to Five News Tonight. I'm Matt Barbet. Some of Britain's best-known politicians could see themselves out of a job after proposed changes to the size of constituencies were outlined today. It means that some MP seats will effectively disappear, and among them, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn's and the former Chancellor George Osborne's. Labour say the plans are unfair and undemocratic, as they stand to lose the most seats, as our political editor Andy Bell explains. 16,692. Yeah! This is how you win power in Britain, constituency by constituency. But now the political map is being redrawn. First principle, to make sure all those constituencies have about the same number of voters. The smallest seat is about 55,000, the biggest seat is about 90,000. That's a very big disparity. So there was a, a, a policy there to try and balance things out so one person's vote would weigh about the same wherever they lived, whichever constituency they were based in. This is what the constituency boundaries look like now, but the Commission's been told to cut the number of MPs from 650 to 600. Under the plans for England and Wales, 465 English constituencies will see some change, and 33 would be abolished entirely. In Wales, the number of MPs would fall from 40 to 29. Those examining the changes agree that Labour stand to lose about 25 seats, the Conservatives about 10. Some well-known faces could be hunting new constituencies. Tatton in Cheshire is due to disappear for the former Chancellor George Osborne. In Yorkshire, the seat of the new Brexit Minister David Davis is being carved up. A Nick Clegg Sheffield constituency could go to. This is Islington North, the constituency Jeremy Corbyn's represented for more than 30 years. But under the proposals, this will be abolished as new constituencies are carved out of this part of North London. The Labour leader will have to make sure he gets one of those. But do the voters really mind about these changes? I love living in Islington, but whether the boundary lines to North and is wherever it is doesn't really matter. I don't know how much impact it would actually have on day-to-day -day life, but then if our MP changed, then it would have an impact. What would be interesting is the, you know, is the, is the outcome. What Member of Parliament do you end up with? Jeremy Corbyn says the changes will give an unfair advantage to the Conservatives and Labour must oppose them. Let's get together to challenge the system the Boundary Commission is using as a party to make sure that there is good democracy in this country with fair and equal representation between all parts of the country. That's what we're doing and that's what we're saying and that's what we're united on as a party. Overdue adjustments that reflect population changes or an unfair redrawing of the political map. Politicians and the public can now have their say. Andy, Jeremy Corbyn and many in his party think this is unfair to them in particular. Do they have a point? Well, Labour's biggest beef, if you like, is that they believe the Boundary Commission's worked off the wrong numbers. They're saying that there are about maybe as many as two million voters who are on the electoral register who came on after December 2015, which is the cut-off point that the Boundary Commission uh, uh, had to follow. But the Boundary Commission say, look, those were the dates that we were given, these are the rules within which we had to operate. And certainly under the report they've produced, there does seem to be a consensus that Labour will lose seats and therefore it will make it harder for them to win the next election. But this still has to get through Parliament, and if Labour oppose it, and there will be a lot of MPs on the Conservative side who are unhappy and you think they may lose seats, well, this still might not get through. Andy, thanks a lot.
The nurse who caught Ebola while working in Sierra Leone is being accused of allowing a wrong temperature to be recorded when she arrived back here in the UK. Pauline Cafferkey almost died from complications that developed because of the virus, but she won't face charges of dishonesty, as Julian Drucker reports. She's the nurse who battled back from a deadly disease only to face a new fight. Pauline Cafferkey survived Ebola, but allegations of dishonesty have clouded her name since. She went to West Africa to aid the sick at the height of the outbreak two years ago. But the Nursing and Midwifery Council had alleged she'd allowed a wrong temperature to be recorded when she arrived at Heathrow from Sierra Leone in December 2014. She was diagnosed with Ebola the next day and put into isolation, being declared free of infection a month later. In February last year, the NMC confirmed she'd be investigated over misconduct. I mean, it was tough the first time, but second time round, it was just... It was horrendous. Speaking in May, she described the meningitis she later suffered, which was triggered by the remaining traces of Ebola in her body. There was so much wrong with my body, I wouldn't know where to start. Like, I had hearing loss and just having the, the worst headache of my life. Seen here arriving at the hearing earlier, Ms Cafferkey was this afternoon told she has no case to answer on the charge of dishonesty. But she still faces claims including not reporting her true temperature to screening staff and not telling them she'd recently taken paracetamol. The nursing regulator has stressed it's not there to punish her. But tonight her reputation and future career remains on hold. Julian Drucker, Five News. German police have arrested three Syrian men suspected of being sent by so-called Islamic State to carry out terror attacks in Europe. A specialist anti-terrorism unit carried out a series of raids seizing phones and computer hard drives. And the Democrat presidential candidate Hillary Clinton says she is feeling much better after falling ill at a 9-11 memorial service on Sunday. She has since admitted that she had pneumonia. Now, if you live in the right part of the country and manage to get outside today, it probably won't surprise you to learn that it was the hottest day of the year so far. In fact, it's been the hottest September day for over a century. The highest temperature was recorded at Gravesend in Kent, a whopping 34.4 Celsius. And those lucky enough to get out of work have headed straight to the seaside. This was bright in this afternoon. But right across the southeast of England, temperatures have passed 30 Celsius. Well, there's been blazing sunshine throughout the east, the Midlands and the northeast. Wales and parts of Scotland haven't been so lucky. I'm sure you've noticed if you're there. Well, one place particularly glorious in the sunshine is Kew Gardens in southwest London. Olivia Kinsley is there now. How is it, Olivia? Well, the last time it reached more than 30 degrees in September, it was here in Kew. And today, it's easily reached that again today. Here they've got the most diverse and the largest collection of plants in the world. And what a beautiful evening to come and view it. I'm joined now by Tony Kirkham, who's an expert in plants and trees here at Kew. Tony, what does this so-called Indian summer mean for all the plants here? Well, it's really the grand finale of the herbaceous plants and it's really giving them the stage to, to perform. And, uh, and these plants are used to this hot weather and it brings the best out in them. So plants like the rudbeckia and the, and the aster here, it, it, you know, it, it allows them to do their best and perform. And this is what they've waited for all year. Does it cause any problems, hot, dry weather, anything that's not faring so well? Well, we, we pref yeah, as gardeners, we're very resourceful and we prepare over the year. So, you know, you have to give them the water and, and the care to, to get them through these conditions. But most of the plants, certainly temperate plants and especially trees, are waiting for this moment. For any green-fingered viewers that we've got at home, can you give us a couple of tips that might help them to keep their gardens looking lovely in this hot weather? Well, you've got to water. You've got to give them water, but water at night uh, after the sun's gone down or early in the morning and that reduces evaporation. 
uh, and harness that moisture by mulching in the garden and, and do that through the summer so that the plants are prepared for this weather in the future. And do you think we'll still soon get autumn leaves like we would in any other year? Well, you know, trees are, have been waiting for this moment. We've been waiting 10 years for an Indian summer like this. Uh, and they need this hot weather. It ripens the wood, it ripens the fruit, and, it, and it's telling the trees to be ready and ready to shut down for the winter. And that's what gives the good autumn colour. And I'm proposing this year that we have the best autumn colour. Well, I'm sure many of you at home will point out very clearly that it's not been hot everywhere. A bit windy, a bit rainy, a bit stormy in parts of Scotland and northern England. A little bit cooler too in Ireland and in Wales. But I hope that if you aren't getting the sunshine, you can at least enjoy the sight of these beautiful blooms. Loving it, Olivia. Thank you very much indeed. And Sean will be here, of course, with the weather forecast at the end of the show. Let's hope it's here to stay. If you've been to the cash point today, you may have pocketed a brand new plastic fiver. The Bank of England's new note is now in circulation in England and Wales. The polymer notes, not quite plastic, are said to be cleaner, safer and stronger than our old paper ones, although Scotland's had them for a year and Northern Ireland has had plastic notes for 17 years already. Minnie Stevenson, though, has been finding out how they're going down with new spenders. You are looking at the brand new plastic fiver with an old face you'll recognise on it, Sir Winston Churchill. Compared to the old paper £5 note, it's supposed to be cleaner, harder to fake and lasts five years longer. There it is, the brand new plastic fiver. Very difficult to take. In fact, it's so strong that you can apparently put it in a spin in the washing machine. Happens to me every time. There are now 440 million of these, so you get a spread. And today, the Governor of the Bank of England turned some heads on his lunch break when he used his first fiver at a market stall, even testing its strength by dipping the new note in curry. So with millions more of us now paying using contactless, I asked the Governor whether money's here to stay. How yeah. relevant are notes? How do you yeah. keep them relevant? Well, many, I mean, I use contactless from time to time. I use it on the tube uh, like, like many other people. Um, but just under half the transactions in the country still use cash. Uh, and actually, demand for cash grew 5% over the last few years, each year. Have you ever left a fiver in the washing machine? We've all done it, but surely you can't have done it. I have to, I have to confess, I have. have you? And I've been disappointed uh, in the results because if you leave the, one of the existing uh, fibers in your jeans, it comes out, it's slightly faded, it's a little tatty, and you, know, you, you, you trade it in at the bank. These will last much, uh, much longer. The arrival of plastic banknotes means Britain is joining a list of more than 30 countries that already use them, Australia being the first in 1988. So being a big spender, I'm armed with a fiver to see whether Britain will buy the new plastic note. It's like Monopoly money. Will you be spending it like Monopoly money? Hopefully. I have yeah. <laughs> like a carrier bag. Feels like a carrier bag? Yeah. Can you see yourself with one of these plastic notes? Yeah, why not? Yeah, it's a bit fake. A bit fake for you. It might slip out my pocket. Initial impressions? It feels weird. It's it's like kids' money, like yeah. play money. As for the old fiver, that expires on May the 5th, 2017. So plenty of time to spend away. Minnie Stevenson, 5 News. Not worth as much as they used to be, though. Coming up on 5 News tonight. From Willy Wonka to the BFG, children celebrate Roald Dahl's most famous characters on what would have been his 100th birthday. We'll see you and more of them after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Five News tonight. It was the most notorious day of the miners' strike. The events at a protest in South Yorkshire in June 1984 became known as the Battle of Orgreave. And today, more than 30 years on, campaigners have met the Home Secretary Amber Rudd to demand a public inquiry into the police's actions that day and also claims of a cover-up. Thousands of miners clash with huge lines of police outside a British steel plant in Rotherham. Officers drafted in from around the country use horses, dogs and riot gear to charge the crowd, an almost unprecedented show of force. Dozens on both sides were injured, around 90 miners were arrested. And these scenes shocked the nation. It marked a turning point in the miners' strike. 
But many of those there say police used excessive force. They believe it was a deliberate setup to convince them they couldn't win the dispute. Those suspicions heightened when the trial of the miners was thrown out, when it became clear the police evidence was unreliable. Since then, it's emerged that officers may have colluded over the evidence and given false statements in court. The force involved was South Yorkshire Police, the same one condemned for its handling of the Hillsborough disaster that happened five years later. I can speak now to the uh, lawyer for the All Grieve Truth and Justice campaign, Henrietta Hill, who's in our central London studio. Good evening to you, Henrietta. You've just come Hello. out of this meeting with Amber Rudd. How did it go? We have. We had a very positive meeting with the new Home Secretary. We're very reassured that she's given a firm commitment to making a decision about whether there will be an inquiry into these important events by the end of October. I mean, of course, a lot of people will look at what you're after and they will immediately think of Hillsborough and what happened, what has since happened there. Same police force as well, of course, and South Yorkshire police have said Chief Constable Dave Jones says he would welcome an independent assessment, says the Hillsborough inquest have brought into sharp focus the need to understand and confront the past. Is, is that the motivation, what we've seen happen with the Hillsborough inquiry and inquests? There's certainly very clear links between the two campaigns. The Hillsborough and Orgreave campaigns have been very supportive of each other. In many ways, uh, establishing the truth about what happened at Orgreave is part of the Hillsborough picture. Uh, the Hillsborough families have the right to know whether what happened at Orgreave paved the way for their own experiences. Uh, there are very clear potential parallels between the two events. Uh, of course, Orgreave involved officers from many other police forces, but South Yorkshire was at its heart. And there are very real concerns that there are similarities between the two events. Well, and of course, Augury was, was uh, you know, several years before. It could be several years more before you get the answers you want. Are the people you represent prepared to wait for that? We are reassured by a commitment today to making a decision by the end of October. We hope that decision will be that an inquiry will be set up. And we hope then that the process of gathering and securing the relevant evidence can start. So we hope it isn't many more years that we have to wait. The uh, all grieved families that I've been helping have waited far too long for this. Many of them have already passed away and won't live to see this day. So we do hope that we won't be waiting very much longer. Now, Henry, so just, just looking at the bigger picture here, how important is it for everybody else to perhaps learn these lessons from the past and reveal the truth of what happened such a long time ago. This is important for everybody. This is about establishing what kind of country we live in. Do we want to live in a country where the police can uh, apparently act with impunity uh, and collude to create false evidence while trying to conceal what they've done? Uh, or do we want to be in a community that tries to deliver truth and justice to people, albeit very late? So I think this is a question that's important for everybody. It's a, it's a, it's a neutral issue across political lines. I think rebuilding trust in the police is a central part of this campaign. Henrietta Hill, many thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Now, first, the BBC lost the contract to show the Great British Bake Off. Now it's been announced its presenters Mel and Sue are standing down. Is that wallpaper paste? It's bread week. I'm not going to eat it. With a sweet signature that could turn sour. I think it's good. Fellow stars Paul Hollywood and Mary Berry are yet to confirm their plans. The announcement follows the news that Channel 4 has paid £25 million for the rights of the show, which the BBC reportedly fell £10 million short of. Miranda Gore-Brown was a contestant on the first ever series of Bake Off back in 2010. We can speak to her now. Good evening to you, Miranda. What do you make of all this news about changes to Bake Off and moving channels and now Mel and Sue deciding to leave it? Oh, I feel really sad about it. I mean, we were there right at the beginning when all the first discussions were taking place about how the programme was going to work and it just feels... It does feel really sad, I have to say, but I think the saddest thing is Mel and Sue leaving. I'm, I think that's going to be a huge change. Now, look, of course, many fantastic programmes exist on many different channels and they hop around sometimes as well and they're still successful. I mean, Big Brother on the channel I'm sitting on right now. So is it feasible that it could be a Channel 4 than it has been on the BBC? Well, it's sort of become a tradition, hasn't it? It's hard to imagine how we can change that. Maybe we're all just a bit fearful of change. I'm sure lots of bright brains will come together and come up with some ideas, but I guess all of us love how it is now and, and it's hard to sort of imagine how it could be different on another channel. Yeah, because there's some people are rightly saying, well, does that mean there'll be adverts in it? Well, you think there probably will be if it's on Channel 4. Does that take something away from the sort of original and unique bake-off experience? Well, I think it does as well, because I think that, I think it's more, for me, it, it, it's lovely that you have that one block of watching and that is what adds to the drama of it. Um, 
I can't, I don't, can't really see how the adverts will work. And I suppose we, I don't know, maybe it'll give us a chance to bake in between some quick bakes in the adverts. Um, that's one positive, I suppose. I think more it'll be about thinking that all of the different pieces of equipment people are using, are they there for a reason? Are they there because people are trying to promote that product? Rather than what's happened up till now is we've just used the kit that we've got and, and we've got on with it. And we've been allowed to bring a few extra bits on, but they've never really been promoted or pushed. And I think it just changes the dimension of the programme. Ah, commercial interest. I mean, some people would say they've seen certain brands of fridge on there that, you know, they, they seem to be very nice and been consistent across the series. Uh, j just to finish off, though, what about the choosing of the competitors? I mean, how were you picked to go on it? And, and what do you make of the way contestants have been picked to go on it over the years? Um, I think it's been always been a very fair process and um, certainly we did quite a lot of different rounds and different judging and different cookery tests in cookery schools in London with Mary and Paul watching and being filmed and then screen tests and lots of different things where we had to have our um, things we'd baked judged and yeah I mean it, it seemed a very thorough and a very rigorous process and I know that Love Productions certainly managed a lot of that very, uh, process all the way through. We were involved in that from sort of the January with applications forms right the way through till the May when we actually um, were selected to go on and be the final 10. OK, Miranda, many thanks. It sounds like you're not sure it'll be a quality bait. Could have a soggy bottom on the other side. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, it has been another golden day for Paralympics GB in Rio. Georgie Hermitage stormed to her second gold of the Games with a world record victory on the track, while Holly Arnold won gold in the javelin as well. Fantastic. And there was gold for Rob Davis in the table tennis too. There was also a gold for Rob Davis, uh, as I said, in the table tennis. And all that has helped Great Britain maintain its standing on the medal table. We remain firmly in second place with 31 golds. China are still in the lead, though. We can overtake them, can't we? His books have been a marvellous medicine for generations of readers. Many have found his exaggerated and horrible characters splendiferous. And today, Roald Dahl would have been 100 years old. And as Leila Hayes reports, his birthday and the stories are being celebrated by kids right across the country. He's the man who invented Willy Wonka and the Oompa Loompas. And his magical characters have shaped countless children's lives. Is it that makes Roald Dahl so special? All his books are really creative and they just hook children in with all the excitement in them. Like, there's lots of chocolate in some of them and children love chocolate. And some of them are scary as well. Do you ever yeah. find them scary? Well, I like some scary. I like different types of books so that they're not all happy and they're not all sad. The only people who are actually mean are the grown-ups and the children are the heroes. Do you so, like that? Yeah. His books have sold more than 200 million copies and been translated into 59 different languages. But 26 years after his death, Roald Dahl is as popular as ever. I think Dahl had an amazingly sort of uh, uncanny sense for how a child sees the world. And that was something that was, was almost unique to him. He was very proud of it, actually, as a person. He often described himself, even when he was old, as a geriatric child and he, he would boast about how he could go into his writing hut and within 10 minutes go back to being six or seven and eight again and I think that's an amazing gift. The hut was a modest hideaway in his garden and it was here he created some of his most fabulous characters. But once you're in you're there and it's lovely and there's no aches or pains or anything and you can lose yourself in your work. Today on what would have been his 100th birthday Don is fondly remembered. He always said, great writers, artists, creative people aren't really recognised until they die. And I think that has happened to Rahl. I think his legacy is now enormous. His characters are adored by children of all ages, and the magic and wonder of Roald Dahl's creations will delight for generations to come. Leila Hayes, 5 News. With me now are current children's authors Robin Stevens, writer of the series The Murder Most Unladylike Mysteries, and Philip Arder, whose books include the Eddie Dickens trilogy. I'm going to begin by asking you your favourites from Roald Dahl's fantastic canon, Robin. 
Uh, my favourite book is Fantastic Mr. Fox. This is actually the edition I had as a kid. Let's have a look at that. I know. Well thumbed. Well thumbed. Pre Quentin Blake, pre the amazing partnership we know now. Well, we'll talk about Quentin Blake in a minute. Why, why Fantastic Mr. Fox in particular? Um, because it's all about naughtiness and badness and characters getting away with things like stealing and, and kind of tricking people. It's all about being really clever and outwitting the evil adults. And I just love it. If we have a good shot at Philip, uh, I think we could, might be able to guess exactly who his favourite character is. Can you guess? Yes, it's Miss Trunchbull. Oh, uh, really? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, it, I have to confess, it's Mr. Twit. It's very easy on uh, Roald Dahl Day. And they say, will you dress up as a character? And I go, yes. And I just... Turn up. Just don't wash. That's right, just turn up. No, it has to be the Twit. It's difficult to choose. Miss Trunchbull is a fantastic character. From Matilda, from the headmistress, Matilda, of course. The headmistress. But, I mean, when you have a, a beautiful plumage, this is my summer plumage. It's longer in the winter. When you have plumage like this, it has to be Mr. Twit. It has I, to be the Twit. It has to be kept clean. You don't want cheddar cheese. No, in no. There. Well, I do say to children, if I'm ever trapped in a lift while they're starving, I just just take out a little bit of <laughs> breakfast and um, relive that golden moment. Philip, why do you think, on what would have been his hundredth birthday, his books are perhaps even more popular than ever? Well, he was the first, really. He was the. You talked about danger, and he was the first who really threw himself into the danger of children's books. He said, you know, you're an adult and you can get away with these terrible things. And I think children love the excitement of danger. Yes, there's the clever language, the silly names, the silly situations, but it's these awful things. You can be turned into a mouse and you stay a mouse. And think of the health and safety in Charlie's Chocolate Factory. Well, exactly, Robin. I mean, are you now thinking about what, not what you can write uh, as an author these days, but what you have to sort of leave out and what's perhaps a bit too dangerous to put in for kids and young readers these days? I mean, he made it okay to have death and and murder even in his books. I mean, I read about murder and I think I can do that because of him and, uh, and of all the terrible things that happened to the characters. But um, at the same time, there's always justice for the bad guys. Nobody ever gets away with it. And that is really comforting and nice. I mean, uh, do you uh, have stories, I mean, I'm not talking about your stories here, but have mm -hmm. stories for kids become more sanitized over the years? Well, I, I have a series called The Grunts, which Axel Scheffler, who drew The Gruffalo, does the pictures of, but in black and white, and they're quite scratch, scratchy and unpleasant because everyone looks like they've been run over by a steamroller <laughs> in, in an Axel Scheffler drawing. Check that when you get home. Um, and I think because we've been given that freedom, uh, they shout at each other and they call each other sponge bag and all these ridiculous things. And I think that's, that's a legacy of yes. that, I would say. And also, Robin, you mentioned Quentin Blake, and for many people, the story and his pictures, uh, you can't separate them, and they're yeah. greater than the sum of their parts. It's just, it's the perfect partnership. They're both so anarchic and crazy and dark and fascinating. You just want to look and look and look and stare at them. I mean, just brilliant. Because they weren't originally drawn, the early ones. I mean, like your early one yeah. there wasn't illustrated by Quentin. He came in quite late on, but ended up illustrating all but one of them. And now there's got to be room for more Dahl in our lives. You see Matilda the Musical doing very well. I know those songs off by heart after a summer in the car, <laughs> listen to them. The kids, there's, there's got to be more musicals and more films, surely, in the can. Well, there's, there's the, the um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is on yeah. in, the, in the West End at yeah. the moment. Of course, we've now got um, Chat with the Big Ears, the Tall Bloke. What's it called? BFG? Uh, BFG. 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 Plenty there, more to so come. There will be plenty more to come. Yeah. Robin, thank you both very much indeed. We've had loads of photos in from people dressed as characters from uh, Roald Dahl. This is Miles Bonner Evans, age five, dressed, and Claire says he's not too impressed by that. Next one sent in by Nicola Hiscox, an excellent Willy Wonka. And we can finish with Let's Have the Fantastic Mrs. Fox because it will make her day quickly. No, oh, it was oh. great though. Bye bye. <laughs>